It's my opportunity to kick off this webinar, and I'd like to welcome all the listeners out there who have joined us for this presentation. My name is Abby Bauer, and I'm an associate editor for Horde Steryman Magazine, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Our presentation is titled, What's Different About Jerseys and What's Not? Horde Steryman and the University of Illinois have been co-hosting these presentations for the past seven years, and our team consists of Jim Baltz at the University of Illinois and our Horde Steryman online media manager, Patty Herchin. So I want to thank them for all the work they do behind the scenes beforehand to make sure we get these webinars off um, and running smoothly. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our presenter, who also happens to be my co-host, Dr. Mike Hutchins. Mike grew up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin, and he attended the University of Wisconsin-Madison to further his education. Since 1979, he has been living a little farther south and has been an extension dairy specialist in the animal sciences department at the University of Illinois. Mike is very active in the dairy industry and is particularly an expert in the area of feeding and nutrition. And our editorial team at Hordes Dairyman is very pleased to be able to work with Mike on many projects, including articles, books, and these webinars. This month's webinar is sponsored by Custom Dairy Performance KTG North America, who is a provider of innovative specialty feed products for livestock and aquaculture producers around the world. We're very happy to have their support of this program and appreciate them wanting to be a part of our webinar series. For anyone who is listening to the presentation live today, you do have access to the slides. Um, if you go over in the GoToWebinar control panel, near the bottom, there is an area that says Handouts. If you click on there, you'll have the opportunity to click on the PDFs of the slide presentation, and you could print that off if you want to follow along and take notes or just have it for future reference. So that's a special feature for anyone who's listening live today. I think those are all the details you guys need right now. So Mike, I'd like to welcome you to another webinar and definitely look forward to hearing what you have to say about this um, topic on Jersey Dairy Cattle. Well, thank you very much, Abby, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to to go live with our group here today, and we have a nice size group. I want to reinforce, you probably really want to print off those PowerPoints because you're going to discover several of the PowerPoints we will not even discuss very much just to show you what's there. And one of the neat things about today's webinar, I think, uh, Abby, and that is that you're going to see all the data, and, and you're kind of the experts now. You can interpret the data. You're going to have a Hutchins twist on it here today, but certainly that may be a bit biased and we're off and running. So let's go ahead and, and get rolling here, and uh, certainly we have our title there, and uh, Jim's got a nice uh, drone photo of our University of Illinois Dairy Herd facility. Well, why did we want to have this webinar here today? And I think there's some real need for Jersey data. And I'll let you read that, but already Abby pretty much uh, indicates a lot of interest in crossbreeding with Jerseys and Jersey numbers. Uh, as many of you know, Illinois is on a quota, and where a quota is pounds of milk, so if you can increase components, you really move there. And then second of all, there's just not a lot of data out there. So we said, let's Let's try to answer that question here. So our first poll, and uh, Jim, is the polls open now? We're, we're off and running here. Abby will let you kind of watch this. The question is, do Jersey nutritionists and farmers feed Jersey cows differently than Holsteins? Kind of curious what our listeners are knowing. we got a nice crowd. Number one is yes, they should. No, doesn't make any difference. Three, only if you split the two breeds. And finally, the fourth choice is depending on dry matter intake, nutrient density of the ration. So I'm not sure, uh, Abby, there's a right or wrong answer here, but the polls are now open at this point, and we are getting some pretty aggressive voting going on. Yes, definitely. I mean, I think probably depends on your situation. I mean, like you indicated here, if the whole scene in jerseys are kept separate in different pens, it's a lot easier to have a different ration for them if they're commingled together. Or like at the Horde Steryman farm, we have Guernseys and jerseys together in some of our pens. So, I mean, then you need to create a ration that's going to work for both those breeds. So, you know, I think probably just depends on each situation and maybe maybe you can tell us what the ideal would be um, if those cattle are commingled, you know, who you need to plan that ration for. Well, let's go ahead and close the polls, Jim. I think we have uh, over 75% in. And uh, interesting poll, as you can see here, uh, the, the numbers, uh, you can jump around and uh, I got to squint a little bit for me to see the numbers here. But uh, um, 
Anyway, there we go. Thank you, Jim. Uh, half of you say now they should have different rations. And I think the right answer, I'm not sure there's a right answer, but it's in yellow, Jim, on the bottom. I think it really depends on the dry matter intakes and nutrient densities of the ration. You be thinking about that as far as that goes. And we, in uh, the survey also said in some cases we just don't, just we, we just feed the same ration of Holsteins and Jersey as we go along. So here we go. Here comes your data. Hang on to your hats and away we go. Uh, we're going to look at the first study that was done in conjunction with American and Jersey Cattle Association. We want to recognize their support and Carrie Wolf here as far as that goes because they helped give us uh, the names of the of the breeders and also gave us some uh, seed money to do the study as well. You can see that both Jim and myself are involved in that and we had two very talented grad students that were involved right now that are actually back in the industry as far as that goes. Here's what happened guys and gals. We got from the uh, American Jersey Cattle Association 110 of their cha- their top cheese yield herds in 2015. Then uh, Jim put together a really neat survey structure uh, instrument that we used, and we we worked it here and to collect the management information. Then we also requested at the same time the the December DHIA report and the feed test results in December and their current rations, both milk and dry cows. We selected December because it's pretty stable time of the year. So if you're wondering, uh, here's the timeline and what happened here. Uh, the first thing we asked if the Jersey Cattle Club would send out a note that's saying, hey, this survey is coming. Otherwise, farmers are going to say another junk survey. So this was very helpful for us at that point. And so you can see uh, three weeks later, Jim followed up and sent the survey out to those people. We had a number of great Amish herds that really wanted to participate, but boy, you had to have electronic equipment to get into the survey. So uh, that was a bit of a, uh, a limitation as far as that goes. And then we received information, as you can see, for over the next months somewhere in March, we sent a reminder uh, email, and we can do all this by email, which really helps us with time and cost uh, to those that hadn't responded. And then in May, I contacted those people that had me confused for unusual information or clarification. So that was kind of our timeline. So it was a very aggressive timeline, especially in May. Now look at this very busy slide. Jim is going to help you out here in a minute, but just gives you a little bit of a feel. And I'm going to take my pointer here, and once I find it, Jim, and it's going to come up here, it's some point i'm sure i'm going to find it and uh uh so far i haven't found it but uh um jim's coming over to save me at some point anyway the point you can see is that we've got the average and this is all the data set here uh, uh that we have and uh then we got mins and maximums and now we've got a pointer that's really good so this would be average mins and max standard deviation for you statisticians there watch this here and that's the number of people who responded uh in the service so we had 32 of the 38 herds that gave us uh, the, the, the the actual cow numbers we didn't complete that on every and then you can come on down and see that and the beauty of this is that Jim then that's why you want to print this off we're just going to highlight uh, the, the averages here so you can see the average herd size milk yield about 64 pounds of milk the fat test modestly high 5.14 and Abby indicated they came back from the Jersey Association and the Jersey Association in 2017 uh, their butter fat test average was 4.89 so uh, these high herds are actually above uh, the, the Jersey averages that appeared in the August uh, 10th issue of Hordes Dairyman uh, protein right about spot on but again, uh, th- that one was 3.70, so a little bit higher. High quality milk, and you can see the rest of the numbers. I guess, Jim, I was a little surprised that we looked down here at age of first calving. I expect that number to be lower, but you can see if you look over here at the mins and max, there were some herds at 21 months of age, and then, of course, some herds at, at, at 25. Here is the, the rations, and again, I'm not going to walk you through all of them, and so we're going to click right along and look at the high group, and these are the two rations I summarized. I pulled off all this data together. So if anything, I would say these Jersey rations are pretty aggressively nutriently dense. Uh, why do I say that? Look at the ADF and NDFs, pretty much on the low end. Sugars and starch and fats are there to get extra energy into the cows. The other thing I thought was interesting, listeners, two-thirds corn size, about one-third other forage types in the ration as well. So it certainly gives you an idea of kind of where we're at. That dry matter, by the way, is percent dry matter, not pounds. So that's percent. More about pounds a bit later. Here's my dry cows. And to me, Jim, they look like an abbey. It looked pretty much like the high straw diet that the University of Illinois has kind of developed here. As you can see, a pretty good level of straw and corn size in these diets, very characteristic as well. So that was kind of interesting. You can study those at your leisure as well. Here comes your corn silages. And again, we're going to click on 
and look at the nutrient value. And this is good corn silage. You can see uh, optimal dry matters. Typically, as you all know, uh, for every 1% increase in dry matter, you'll get about a percent increase in starch. So you can see uh, this. these are running 34% starch uh, levels here. Uh, protein, very typical. Uh, if you take a look at the UNDF numbers down there, and there weren't a lot of those there, but those that were there, you can see uh, pretty much that's the average of corn silage. But if you, if you sneak over here and we, we highlight that, you'll see the minimums. That's BMR. That's BMR right there as far as that goes. So certainly we had BMR. More about that a bit later. Then we looked at legume and grasses. And this is kind of a mixed bag. And I got your ears on. Are you listening? One of the real problems I had is I never knew which forages were going to go in which rations. And so this is all the forage test results we had, both dry cow and milk cow. So you can see that's why some of those minimums look and maximums looks a little spooky as far as that goes. And so just be careful with this data. Uh, it's not as clean, and I would say, as what the corn silage data was, but it gives you a little bit of a scope. And again, if we back up, you can see we got some Expo. We got some Expo uh, forward sitting here with the RF, uh, v RFQ of 230. And you might ask, why do you want to use both of those? And because we had a mixed bag with that information coming in. Then what about bunk space? And again, that's why I hope most of you printed this off because all I'm going to do is highlight in green. I think that's where I would like to be. Uh, some of you Jersey enthusiasts might think that's too much bunk space. Uh, you know, Holsteins are 24, but you talk to the guys now, 30 inches is pretty common. So if you take a look at that, you can see a uh, bunk space wise, uh, we, we do a pretty good job here, especially notice down here in, in the in the dry cow pens, you, you, can, you, can, you can see that a pretty good numbers as well. We then look at different housing systems. And again, one of those PowerPoints I will say nothing about. We did have herds from California and Arizona that came in here in Texas. So certainly that would probably bias some of the data on the corral and open lot structures. We also had a number of herds that came from the Midwest and New England area. And I'm sure that biased a little bit more ties towards the tie stall. So it is what it did. Just a quick comment down here on the bottom where it says heifers. That is first lactation cows. We did not capture any of the young stock data here in, in the study. Here's one that's interesting to me. We look at stalls per cow. And uh, in other words, uh, if, uh, you can see in the dry cow program, we have more stalls than cows, so we don't crowd those cows very much. If you look at all the milking herds, it's pretty much, you can see a little bit of overcrowding here, but pretty much one stall, one cow. So again, you can take a look at that at your leisure. I was expecting that this number might pattern with my dry cow. I was hoping my fresh cows would have more like uh, 1.2 or something like that to get the job done. And again, you can see if there's any group that's being uh, crowded, and of course, there's only eight observations, it's the first lactation cows, and that's probably a bit of a, a challenge, as we would say, here in the Big Ten. So again, you can look at that data at your leisure and focus on it as well. Switching gears now to, to go to the additive area, we're going to come back and look at this kind of Jim Cutton slices a couple different directions here. Uh, you can see again that the Jersey breed owners and nutritionists are using lots of feed additives. And you can see the percent that are using it. There's your N for the numbers and uh, not a lot of big surprises here. Uh, but we did, we're going to break it out a little bit more uh, individually and you can take a look at that and, and be a Monday morning quarterback here as well. Here's your close up ration. And uh, Jim, not a big surprise here, or Abby, you can see anionic products. 85% of my Jersey people are using the DCAD products, trying to adjust uh, the, the blood uh, uh, urine pH is down, we should say, not the blood, but the urine pH is down here. And so you can see uh, out of 27 that responded uh, to that question, 23, 85% were showing that as well. And high use of organic trace minerals. And I think that's encouraging to see as well. And again, you can work your way down. You can see the, a third of the people we're using the binders, uh, the mold the binders and uh, microtoxin binders as far as that goes out there in the program. Here's your far off dry cow program. And again, now you can see that uh, properly anionic products, uh, you drop down to 37% instead of the real high 85%. That probably reflects the ability to separate those two groups. And uh, we, we didn't summarize our data that way, but we didn't have a lot of close up rations to be really honest with you, as you'll see here in just a minute. And again, you can see uh, where we're at on far off. Here's the high group, and now you can see your bio, but your buffers are coming marching on in big strength, 96% here, and you can read the rest of it down. Uh, interesting to my eye was the heat stress cation products. About a, th a third, about 30% of the dairy of those Jersey breeders were you are trying to help on heat stress using those products in the summertime, and of course, we've had a really hot summer as well. 
Here comes the Rumenzen information. Uh, I thought we'd break it out, and I'm going to click on it. This is where I would probably draw my line, in the green. Every time you see green, that's uh, for Hutchins. Hutchins is half Irish, and uh, that's where I'd probably want to be. So you can see most of my Jersey people aren't at the higher levels. I think if we click uh, backwards here, Mike, and open up it, I think you'll find this is probably the more common number as you come across the lines as well. I think there's some pretty neat data that shows higher levels of Rumenzen or Monenzen for fresh cows is recommended, and we, we don't see that in our data set here, and uh, you can track this on out. But there are some pretty, here. here's a, an example uh, of a herd, you know, that has pretty high levels in that time period as well. So you could see the percent in the levels, and we thought that was interesting as well. What about RBST? Remember, this study was done in 19, in 2016. We collected the data, and you can see two-thirds of the people were not using RBST, and a third were. This data says those that were using RBST pretty aggressively, well over half their cows, pretty much on label use as far as that goes. I'm sure some of this was dictated because if you're in the fluid market, you were not allowed to use RBST at that point. And, of course, we hadn't seen the shifts in the cheese and butter markets yet at that point. So that's kind of interesting. We'll come back and visit this here a bit later. Here's one that's interesting to me. I thought I see a lot more 3x milking here. Um, still the most common, two-thirds. You can see our 2x milking. We did have a couple robot herds here and that. There weren't enough for us to pull those out and look at them individually. Here are your mixers you can take a look at. Uh, again, uh, the verticals are the most popular, and I think herd size probably indicates that the most popular is going to be the two-screw system here uh, And when we look at the different types of mixers out there on the, on the, uh, on the farms. Next question Jim and I asked was how many times do you review or reformulate the ration? I was, I was guessing in green we do it every month but you can see well there are some people that are really aggressive they do it weekly uh, you know uh, or by uh, for uh, uh, you can see the numbers there uh, 11% and then you've got a, a quarter of them that says well about every every four months we're going to re or every three months we reshuffle the deck so I guess I, that that surprised me a little bit and I'm maybe it doesn't surprise you listeners out there but that's where it's at. Another question that parallels this is how often do you test your forages? And not a big surprise, these are mirror images of each other because usually when you retest the forages, you're going to reformulate the ration. So these two pretty much go hand in hand as far as that goes. We did want to ask about moisture testing, especially with TMRs because TMRs can vary in moisture. It depends if it rained last night, we had snow, uh, if the, we got into a wetter or drier silage on the farm. And so you can see that uh, how often do we do this? You can see not as often as I thought we might see it as far as that goes, uh, especially since you and I can do that on the farm with a coster tester or with a food dehydration system. There's e really easy ways to get this done. And you can see the, the person that seems to be the most interested in it was the nutritionist and the veterinarians because they would check it more frequently, as you can see, as driving it here. And unfortunately, only there's 18% said we only check it when there's a problem. And that's kind of like getting uh, closing the barn door after the horse gets out. What about frequency of feeding? Uh, again, a little surprised here. I thought I'd see more 2x uh, here. Remember, we didn't have a lot of 3x herds, so normally, you know the thumb rule there. It's fresh feed after each milking. But again, 42% uh, were only feeding once a day. And I wonder about that a little bit, especially this time of the season. Of course, we did this survey in December, so that could show maybe a little bit of a bias in there as well. Here's an interesting number to look at, and you can see I'm biased in the green again. A uh, number of times you push the feed up, uh, I'm going three to four times a day, especially since we're only feeding once or two X as far as that goes. Notice uh, almost 40% are going multiple times of there. And the reason you ask why, Hutchins, do you have the green at, at three to four times a day? And that's because I've been on way too many farms, and we see the skid steer or the tractor go by, pushing up the feeds, and the cows go ho-hum and nobody comes to eat the feed and the whole purpose is to pu pu push that fresh feed in front and entice the cow to come back and have another small meal so again uh, my biases maybe you draw the green line some other place as well 11 uh, percent don't push up any feed at all and you wonder a little bit about uh, their their bunk design and uh, where they're dropping feeds on the farm 
Here's an interesting one on waybacks. Uh, this is the feed refusals, what percent. And again, this was a, again entered by the dairyman. I wish we were out there in the firing and measured it. We could not. I'm guessing 2 to 3% where I would be on these higher producing strings of Jersey cows. And you can see the most popular was 1 or 2%. And I think it reflects uh, today's in 2016 and 17 milk markets and milk prices and feed costs. And so you can see where that spreads out. Uh, uh, two to three percent would be our our recommendation uh, on high and so high producing herds, especially average herds, one to two percent, because I'm I'm not going to invest too much loss in feed. Now the question is, where do you put that feed once these waybacks would go? And you can see my magic number in green are steers. Now remember, folks, these are Jersey steers, so that may not be a very popular answer uh, on it, because many cases um, Jersey farms aren't maintaining steers on their farm. Uh, a few do because they said we're not going to give them away as far as that goes. And uh, you can see the most popular answer was to heifers. Hopefully those heifers are at least 12 months of age or breeding age uh, heifers as far as that goes because I don't way bass can be so variable in the amounts and in the composition I don't want it going to my dry cow so 12 percent we're feeding the dry cows I think that's a mistake as far as that goes can you remix it sure you can 24 percent said they threw it away uh, that would be good if you're looking at some of the health parameters like yonis but uh, I'm Dutch remember I'm Dutch so I'd be a little tough to throw away that pretty valuable feed you saw the qualities there a bit earlier Here's how all the forages are stored. I'm not sure there's a message. Some of you may find that of interest to you. The number I want to look at is silage inoculants over there. And I guess I was disappointed. I think there's enough data out there that says we should be really aggressive. And we should be, I was hoping to see 70 to 80% numbers pop up. And the only number that popped up was under sorghum silage. And that's kind of a tougher one to probably uh, uh, ferment and, and store in southwestern parts of the United States. We don't see a lot of sorghum silages here in the Midwest. West area right now. So I guess there's one wake up call to me that says I think there's an opportunity there with side inoculants here in these good Jersey herds. How do you handle hay? Again, take a peek at that. Look at that at your leisure. I'm not sure there's anything highlighted in green here. Uh, it is what it is. And next we ask, did you use, a, a, and usually we're looking for hay preservatives here. We're looking for an acid usually. A dry inoculants don't work well for hay because you don't have enough moisture to make them work. And you can see we're assuming that uh, this is going to be uh, uh, the uh, percent here that uh, are using the acid type products and you can see that uh, people when they buy the hay it's not a high priority so those probably go together as we look at the hay one. Now we're going to switch gears, guys, because I get your eyes and ears on. We're going to look at some of the fresh cow stuff. I thought it was interesting. You can see, uh, surprisingly to me, that about half the people had a fresh cow group. And maybe that reflects some of the herd size and locations, but I think that's a real disappointment. Hopefully, we might do a webinar on fresh cow feeding dynamics here in 2019. But certainly, uh, you can see not a lot of fresh cow diets there. And then the question is, notice the number drops down to 17 on the average 30 days. I think that's too long. If I was going to highlight this, I would look at uh, 10 as a 10 to 15 as the range there. Uh, 31 days to me is long because we're waiting we got to move these cows from the fresh cow diet to the high ration because most fresh cow diets are step up rations as we would say so then jim asked the question how do you determine when the fresh cows are ready to move to another group and you can see in green, I think those are the four right answers. Now, the problem with milk production is you have to have daily milk production. But boy, trust me, if cows, if fresh cows aren't milking well, uh, that fresh cow probably has got some other problems going on. Feed intake, most farmers aren't going to measure, but I'm looking at feed intake simply saying, how aggressive are these my fresh cows when fresh feed are put in front of them? Do they really attack it and consume it? Body temps would be wonderful to determine if there's infection in there. And rumination collars would be the ultimate. But how many uh, people in 2000? 2016 had rumination collars on their cows for, uh, for that set purpose. That might be 4% as far as that goes. What scared me was days and milk. I think that's a bad criteria. It simply says that... Uh, you know, a days in milk or whenever there's a, whenever they need to move cows out of the group. Bad answers because now the facility is telling me more so than the, the cow herself. 31%, uh, I like that answer. The cow's general appearance. Now, we're not looking at body condition score. We're looking at such things as droopy ears, uh, evidence of dehydration, the amount of rumen fill on the left side of the cow, uh, uterine discharges, those things. And that would probably be a, a good way to go. I think it's a powerful, powerful 
PowerPoint that says uh, there are opportunities here, I think, in some of these high-producing Jersey herds. With the fresh cows, are we popping calcium boluses? And you can see uh, there, I can't tell you the percent. I went back and looked at my data, and we, I, I, we never summarized how many farmers were actually using calcium boluses. But those that reported, you can see that 37% are using them incorrectly, meaning that it is used as a treatment. Uh, 32%, I think, is the right answer. Uh, second lactation cows, greater uh, lame cows, cows that have a body condition scores uh, that are, are low. Those are the, the researchers support that. And uh, 8% said we, we're just going to give them to all the cows. We just think it's a, a good practice. We're going to pop an $8 bolus in there. Uh, there is some new data out there now that some of these boluses will actually maintain blood calcium for 24 hours. So have your eyes and ears open out there using unique calcium products to maintain blood calcium levels. Here's your fresh cow. And again, uh, I went back and looked, and you can see there's no boluses there. But again, my fresh cow, as you can see, buffer and rumens and really uh, stay at the top here at this point. Uh, you're going to come down and uh, see a, a fair number of DCAD, uh, excuse me, uh, direct fed microbials uh, sitting here as well. Uh, one farmer, he's just got to get the antibiotic out of the, uh, maybe he just made a mistake in the survey. But the last thing I don't need in my fresh cow is an antibiotic product, unless of course it's for heat abatement. Then let's uh, look at health issues. And here we go. Uh, not a lot of big surprises here. And uh, uh, milk fever, five uh, percent, and that's probably uh, typical for Jerseys. Ketosis, probably with the high milk production, a little higher, and we'd like to see that number more of a two or three percent. That's the the bad news on this PowerPoint. The good news is right below it uh, with the displaced abomasums. Uh, you can see uh, un under under two percent uh, here today. A uh, retained placentas and metriatus quite low as well. So certainly uh, these cows clean up pretty nicely. That may also reflect calving ease, and that's one of the reasons we hear all the time with jerseys and crossbreds, uh, those calves literally pop out of those cows rather than some of this extreme difficulties we see some of the larger breed uh, cattle out there as well. So then we'll go to our second phase. We're still in that big Jersey field study, so stay with me here. And we'll go to statistical analysis. And here's where my grad students really came into play. And we asked them to answer four questions for us. So we took our data, and the first case, and uh, uh, I'm not sure, sure uh, Sarah Morrison is on, but she was instrumental in pulling this data together along with Kristen. And uh, you can see that we split our data in half, roughly at 20,000 pounds of milk. We asked, and we summarized all the data, again, all all the data you saw earlier, now we took and looked at it rather than looking at, at averages or, or, or the total population now, subpopulations of it. And here we'll take a quick look at it, and you can see no differences. Uh, uh, well, there are huge differences, obviously. You can see uh, significant uh, p-values, uh, 0.001 over there in terms of a milk yield, rolling herd averages, uh, all those things fit together. No effects on age of the animal here. And uh, small, interesting numbers, but again, the Stats would say that butterfat test is not real. The 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 high producing herds butterfat was no different than lower ones, even though that that looks almost eye catching to me. But the stats say, sorry, Mike, you're wrong. And of course, the protein, no difference is there. So rather than show all that data to you, you have to trust me here. So in the high herds, we tended to have high, uh, higher protein uh, uh, levels in the dry cow program for these high herds, high producing herds. They also looked like they had more BMR corn size in them, they had less metritis, and they tend to have lower somatic cell count and more 3X milking. That probably makes pretty good sense. So the differences, I would argue, were fairly minor. I thought there'd be more a home run there. What about the BST? So again, we split this into those that were using BST, those that were not using BST. We ran that whole data set again. And surprisingly, folks, there's nothing there. I would have bet a piece of pie that my BST herds would have had higher milk production, uh, and uh, there's no difference in components, and that sh uh, should that's exactly what the research said should be there. But that surprises me. Again, what do we find in the BST herds? Uh, we we had a little more nutrients in them, a more fat, less ADF, less hay. So we were probably a better ration, if you wish, in the RBST herds here. Uh, we, uh, I think the dry cow rations looked more of them. They had the high straw diets there. Uh, we tended to uh, use uh, uh, lower UNDF numbers in the, in, in the RBST herds. I wish I had more data. Folks, there just wasn't a lot of UNDF numbers on the forage test results. And I looked at every one of them suckers, and there just wasn't a lot of it there uh, as 
crossfire as a tool there and of course a little more frequency so perhaps you and I would agree a little more aggressiveness in feeding and management program but the bottom line was there was no more milk there was no more milk what about herd sizes and again here comes a piece of pie bet my bet would have been that the larger herds uh, would have had uh, some responses here. Again, uh, Sarah split these pretty much at the 200 cow level. You can see uh, that's where we decided to pull the trigger. And some of you say, well, gee, Mike, it looks like you're, you, you should have had more larger herds. And I'm sorry, guys and gals. It is what it is. That's what we got in. And we ran that whole matrix again. And let's take a look at that. And you can see, surprising to me, that... The, I thought the large herds would have more milk. Uh, they have a slightly lower somatic cell count. That doesn't surprise me there, although that is not statistically significant there. Uh, there's nothing there on herd size. I would have bet a piece of pie, Jim, that we would have seen something there. So trusting me, again, there was no differences in milk production, RBST use, and the only thing we saw was more push-ups in the larger herds. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? So surprises for me in the data, uh, and, and that's it. Now here comes our fourth uh, parameter that uh, Sarah looked at, and that is well, look at herds that were 100% pure Jersey versus those that were not pure Jersey. Now I want to tell you what Jim Baltz did is he took that data and he summarized those Jersey cows off their DHI reports as a separate herd. So there's no Holstein or Brown Swiss or, or crossbred data in here. It is honest to goodness, Jersey to Jersey, but the only difference was that in some herds they had some other breeds on there as well and here we go and you can see it's uh, surprising to me again not statistical but an interesting trend a little bit more milk uh, in those herds that had other breeds in it but not statistically significant uh, you can see again no uh, no differences in components although I look at that and say gee that's kind of interesting uh, to me as well uh, there was a little difference in somatic cell count uh, in the uh, in the uh, non pure Jersey herds here and that's about only action we saw as well. I thought I might see something in first age of calving, thinking that uh, the jerseys were being held back and by those other breeds. It didn't pop up. So that was really surprising. I expect to see more of that here. So what did we see with the, with the uh, mixed herds? Uh, more 3X milking, more waybacks, more feed refusal. And I thought that was pretty, and that was, that was a trend. That was statistically a trend. And so we tended to be more aggressive feeding uh, these jerseys in these, uh, in these mixed herds there. And we saw a little bit more ketosis and a little higher somatic cell count in the jersey herds, which may reflect also not quite the aggressiveness in feeding programs. So my take-home message was that mixed herds a little more aggressive there. Uh, it was the same ration, by the way. They didn't have separate rations. I didn't get any of those uh, to answer that question we asked a bit earlier. So as we wrap up this part of the study, we're right on, on time here. What were the limitations? I could not collect the dry matters. But get your ears on. Now write this down. Get your pencil out here. I went back and looked at what the nutritionists, the veterinarians, or the dairy managers were targeting. And the average dry matter for the high group cows were 44 to 45 pounds of dry matter matter. The range was 43 to 49. So um, again, that is what was reported on the ration printouts. That's not what's going on out there in the feed bunks. So remember, we had waybacks that go there as well. The dry cows average about 24 to 25 pounds of dry matter. In the dry cow program, this would be the far off dry cow programs, and the range was 22 to 29. We had one robotic herd that did report in, and they were feeding 36.7 pounds of dry matter through the PMR. And then, of course, the rest of the nutrients was coming off the pellets in, in the robotic program. Uh, we had, uh, in, some, in some farms, I had six TMRs. Uh, Jim allowed up to seven. And boy, what a difficult thing to do. And finally, I said, we're going to go with the far-off dry cows and the high group. That's what we did. And that's the two we summarized. We already mentioned about the legume grass forages is the problem. And in a perfect world, we would have visited every one of those farms, Jim and myself, or one of the grad students, and we sat down for four hours and collected all that data. Not very possible with the grant of uh, $2,500 that we had. So Jim, we're going to switch gears now to our last part of the webinar. Open up the polls here. So Abby, it's your turn again. The poll question, interesting. Now listen to me carefully. Do Jersey cows vary in the ratio of peak milk to total milk uh, in that given lactation based on the herd average? 
Understand what we're asking? We're saying, what's the relationship between peat milk and total yield in the herd? And some of you are going to say, yes, uh, there, there, there is, the, the ratio does vary, and it depends on peat milk and herd average, yes, because it depends on lactation number or parity, yes, it depends on days in milk, lactation number, nope, there's no relationship there. Uh, the, the old thumb rule, uh, 200 pounds times peat milk is, um, is still working, or 200 and uh, 50 pounds for DHIA peak. So the polls are open. We're off and running here. And uh, wow, it's uh, really interesting here. Abby, we'll let you uh, take over. Thanks, Mike. I am going to take the second choice that the ratio depends on milk yield and lactation number for parity of the cow. Um, that, that is just a guess, though. I'm really intrigued to hear what you have to say about that. Okay, well, Jim, I think because of time, we want to keep our pretty tight. Let's close the poll. Obviously, my Democrats are boycotting me here today. So you can see, uh, Abby, uh, you can see that you had the most popular answer. 55% uh, said uh, that it does depend on uh, on parity or lactation number. Uh, some have said herd average. Some says uh, days in milk. And then some says, nah, there's nothing there. And so here we go. So I've got to click on this. i got to remember how to do this. And here's part two of our our webinar here today, and that is looking at the relationship of milk yield components to herd average and parity. I want to thank the North Carolina Processing Center. Uh, they process just about all the milk records east of the Mississippi River, and of course, uh, Dr. John Clay was instrumental in pulling this together. So again, you can see, and and, and we collect data, we kind of really have to have uh, friends to help us here as far as that goes. So here we go. Again, let's take a quick look at this very busy slide, and then Jim is going to break it down for me here in in, in just in, in just a minute. And uh, there's there's how you get my pointer. I got to click on it, Jim. I figured it out. Okay, take a look. And over here we got lactation, lactation one, two, and three and greater. Then we looked at four different levels of milk production. Uh, this is pretty much the blue is pretty much the breed average here. Uh, these are all my good herds. This would be the the survey herds to be sitting right down here in green. Uh, so we got four different levels of milk production. Then I got peak milk production over here. There's your answers. We're gonna look, we're gonna focus on that in just a few minutes. And and then I got it broken out, or John broke it out from one to 40 days. Guys and gals, this to me, that reflects transition management. In other words, if these numbers don't match up, then you are really dropping the ball in transition cows. Then you'll come over here. This is going to be where peak milk should be. And sure enough, uh, if you look at all the data here in the Jersey, you'll see all these numbers are in this here. We expect our Jersey cows to peak and Holsteins and Brown Swiss and crossbreds somewhere around 60, 70 days after milking here is mid and late lactation cows. So uh, powerful. And in my view, here is uh, for you nutritionists and veterinarians online here, here sits the PowerPoint. Hopefully you've printed it off. What's the good news in the in the August 25th issue of Hordes Dairyman? This table is going to pop up here again. And so uh, we're going to go to the next PowerPoint. Whoop, went to hit the wrong number. And now Jim pulled it out. So uh, Abby, you were right. You and 55% of you were right. You can see peak milk Related to the rolling herd average, you can see in first lactation that number is pretty close to 300. You come down here to second lactation cows, that's closer to about 240 or 250, the old thumb rule. And then you get in late lactation cow, I mean, uh, the third lactation cows, and now you can see it's pretty close to uh, 215, 210. And basically, it, 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 and we aren't surprised, at least I'm not surprised. It simply says that older cows peak higher than young cows do, and that's true in the Holstein breed as well. How do I know that? Because you're going to see in the August 25th issue this same data set for Holstein cows, and and, and and we back up. Now, why am I excited about this, uh, John Clay? I'm not sure John is on here today, but I'm excited because I call it curve jumping. So let's say that I've got a 19,000 pound herd average. That I've got a good Jersey herd here in, in the United States. And all of a sudden I discovered my cows are peaking at 60 pounds of milk. Doik, 
It's, meaning doik means wah, something's happened here. Because now suddenly they're peaking as if they're at a 17,000 pound herd. So that would be a problem. Then I'd go back here and see, well, if wh- wh- where is any of these numbers uh, off? And I would say since they're peaking, I would expect this number won't be quite as aggressive. Why could that be? It could be metabolic disorders. It could be dry matter intake. If heifers, it could be uh, the competition or the, the growth uh, spurts of the heifers. So the question is, do some of your Jersey herds Jersey uh, uh, curve jump. And, and and so what I do is I print this table out and then I would have a fifth line underneath it and write your herd average down and then write your numbers down and then circle it where it appears up here in the chart. I, I think it's some really neat stuff to take a look at here in, in the future to diagnose to diagnose Jersey herds here today as what we're talking about. Now, John, Dr. John Clay gave me another thing that I, I didn't ask for. Uh, we needed to have higher data on higher producing herds. And uh, you'll hear now that the, the new fourth edition of the feed guide came out and we just had an increased milk uh, milk production. And so what we have that same breakout here, but now we got fat. And so if my memory is right, I'm going to hide all the rest. Now look at this. Remember, now this would be pretty typical of that Hordes dairyman data that we had back in the uh, August 10th issue. Remember, butter fat test was 4.89. Do you see what I see here? And the first 100... F- 100, 100, 100 days, that number is not there. That number is not there. And you can also see that the herds in green, that Jim Highline in green, my high producing herds, they get a lot closer to that 4.8. And if you sneak over here, you can see we get there eventually, but you can see that the high herds obviously are doing a better job. Is that management? Is that nutrition? Is that health? I, I don't know. But the point is, the, all these herds, especially herds that are uh, at 15 and 17 and 1,000 pounds of milk are leaving a lot of money on the table because they have to figure out why are these components so low in the first 100 days. And some of you at really good herds are also saying, you know, Mike, ah, maybe we need to, in this case, this is milk fat. Do we have to look at dry matter intake? Do we have to look at inert fats? Uh, what, are, what are we going to do on, on that one as well? Here's the milk fat to milk protein ratio. And if you go back to the Hordes Dairyman issue, uh, August uh, uh, 10th, that number is 1.32. And folks, it doesn't change. So if the butter fat is low, the protein is low. And so that ratio does not change in the first 40 days. I did not work it out for all the rest of them, but this is the first 40 days. And so they did not change. And so now we're going to go over and look at the protein. And lo and behold, as you said, if the butter fat was low, by George, the protein is low too. And take take a look. Now, remember, these are jerseys. Uh, jerseys that normally will have b- uh, milk protein. And for our, our non-U.S. listeners, uh, Canadians, Europeans, this is true protein. Got to make sure you understand that. So we're going to be about two tenths of a point below uh, you colleagues in uh, in New Zealand or in uh, Denmark or in uh, in Holland, wherever you're listening. As far as that goes, we're going to be lower there as well. Okay, so in summary, let's wrap this up, and we're right on time. Uh, time I want to be done in, in 42 minutes, and we're right on. I, I, I think uh, my three take-home messages, number one, high-producing herds have high nutrient-dense rations. So I, I think we, we do go after it and try to help our cows out. We may need to help them out a little more in early lactation. Number two, I think there's some opportunities to fine-tune rations. For example, fresh cow groups, level rumenzin, the way back, so use the side inoculants, and maybe you were making a list as we were going through here. <coughs> excuse me, of opportunities. And then as we already mentioned earlier there, I think there's some real opportunities in the first 100 days of milk and we should analyze that, evaluate that and determine is there money being left on the table. So I want to mention two other things. Uh, just came out in the uh, last issue of Hordes Dairyman. The, the new uh, f- a feeding guide came out, the fourth fourth edition. So uh, this does not have the new NRC in it. We struggled with that. We waited for a year and a half. And the word is 2020 might be when the new NRC comes out. And so not only is it in hard copy, but you also get it as an iBook. The beauty of the iBook that Jim put together here, it's got some videos showing some uh, hands-on things such as uh, manure washing, 
uh, body condition scoring, uh, things like that as well. And of course, that's available. So those both are available online right now. Uh, number two, you're welcome to come in and uh, uh, our dairy class, you would have seen it advertised in the last Hordes Dairyman. We have our ca uh, calf and heifer class starting in August 29th or 28th, I should say, along with the ration building and balancing. So you're welcome to come and visit us there. And with that, we're ready to look at our questions. So Abby, we'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, that was a very informative presentation. Um, that was a kind of a unique research project that you guys did, getting some data from farms. And I think not only some valuable information for Jersey producers, but just kind of some interesting data from dairies in general, especially when it came to terms of feed storage, barns, um, some treatment, just to kind of give us a general a snapshot of some of the dairy farms across the country. So thank you for sharing that today. I also want to give another um, thanks to our sponsor for today's webinar, Custom Dairy Performance, KTG North America. Um, they are definitely um, something that we appreciate. We are glad they were willing to support our program for today, and we're glad to have them on board. If you want to listen to this webinar again, or any of our previous webinars, you can visit our archives at any time, available on our website at hordes.com slash webinars. All of you that are listening today will also receive a survey later this week where you'll have an opportunity to evaluate the presenter and the topic. And we certainly appreciate your feedback in that survey. We hope that you'll make plans to attend some of our future webinars that are coming up here in the next two months. In September, we will have a presentation titled Bolstering Transition Cow Immunity. That presentation will be given by Marcus Curley from the National Animal Disease Center, um, part of USDA, based out of Ames, Iowa. So looking forward to hearing what he has to say on transition cow immunity. And then looking forward into October, which will actually be after World Air Expo, which is hard to believe that we're getting that late into the year already. But that presentation will be called um, and focused on the feed supply and the quality of cards we've been dealt with this harvest season, presented once again by Mike Hutchins and then Mike Rankin, who is our Hayden Forge Grower um, Managing Editor and a longtime Extension Specialist based at the county level um, in the University of Wisconsin Extension Service. So look forward to hearing that presentation in October. Um, I guess, Mike, if you want to go ahead now and answer any questions that have come in. I know we had some before the presentation and a few during it. So why don't you go ahead and answer those questions at this time? Okay, very good, Abby. And we do have a few questions that we can uh, discuss. We encourage you to send your questions in earlier. Uh, this one was really, uh, Greg, thank you very much uh, for sending this in because we, we we didn't delve into that in our presentation. But he asked, we think jerseys are more efficient compared to other breeds. Is that true, Greg? And the answer is, yes, it is. And the power of Greg sending in is that Jim Bolts and I could do some digging to see what we could find. We're going to answer two ways, Greg. So the answer is yes. The, the first answer comes from the NRC. NRC. What do you mean by the NRC? And the answer there is, if you look at a thousand pound, uh, thousand pound Jersey cow, which is pretty, pretty, pretty comparable, then and a 1400 pound Holstein cow, which is not a huge Canadian Holstein cow, that difference in energy requirement is 2.2 mcal's a day. And so it simply means that I've got to feed my my big breed cows 2.2 mcal's every day just to keep them alive to meet their maintenance requirements. If you translate into dry matter, that's just right around three pounds of dry matter. And those of you online, you know that dry matter is 10 or 12 cents a pound of dry matter. And so there we go. So there's a 30 cent per day. So every day that you've got Holsteins and jerseys on your farm and they get up in the morning, uh, it's going to cost you 30 cents more to feed those Holsteins as far as that goes. That Jersey cow then can take her dry matter, <coughs> excuse me, and convert that into milk and therefore she becomes more efficient. But the better study comes from Australia. And Jim found this study here, and, and they looked at the milk yield. And, and you know, we might want to think about this in the U.S. They look at solids of milk, that's fat and protein, per kilogram of dry matter. So it's grams of solid per kilogram of dry matter. And sure enough, the jerseys win. And they win by about an average of advantage of about 6.2%. Not only in the paper that Jim found, they had New Zealand data, they had European data, and they had U.S. data. And the uh, the in, in terms of milk solids for dry matter, the, the New Zealand animals were slightly more efficient. Of course, those are pasture-based. Now, that's a question. How do you get the pasture 
different numbers, but that's where we're at compared to the European and U.S. data. So, Greg, a great question there, and the answer is yes, it is. And that's why we're seeing some movement too towards jerseys on this question along with the um, uh, the components as far as that goes. And also there's a great paper that was done in the U.S. in the Journal of Dairy Science about three years ago that showed the same thing. Another question came from the Netherlands, and I know you're on, online here today, and his question was, we have 100% grass-based rations and 200 days grazing. What can you tell me more about how to run that with jerseys? And here's my biased answer. Now, before I answer his question, I'm going to ask you this question. Number one, uh, what's the economics of the pasture-based system out there in your country or in your area as far as that goes? And how much milk production do you have to get per hectare to, to really compete out there? The reason I say that is because now you get my biased answer. And that answer is I need about 40% of the Jersey dry matter uh, that I control, that I can match up with the pasture quality and availability and nutrient profile. So in other words, it's, it simply says that I want to try to take out some of those bumps in which grass quality is less is not there or the dry matter is restricted. And I think that's one of the problems I saw in New Zealand was uh, my grass-fed animals just couldn't eat enough dry matter without bringing other, other concentrates and other feed ingredients into the feeding program. I also want to bring some functional fiber. I'm probably going to bring in some inert fats in there. I'm also going to bring in something that's going to uh, uh, dilute down or slow down uh, th those, uh, those those rapid rates of passage as far as that goes. So my answer, uh, uh, you may not agree with me, Tennis, but I, I'm, I'm just going to want to have some of the ration that I can adjust for. And I saw several herds in New Zealand doing that when I was there five or six years ago, and they were do feeding a partial TMR in a, uh, on a feeding lot. And and that was before they went in the milking parlor. So uh, all I know is I was on two of the farms, and when they opened the gates, they could care less how big I was. They were going to go to those feed bunks. In a matter of about 15 to 16 minutes, they had consumed all that dry matter, and then they went into their parlor, and then they went out to pasture after that. We do have a herd in Illinois that does very well. Uh, his milk production is, is, is certainly at a very good level, and they are feeding a uh, pasture-based system because they are marketing grass-based milk off their farm, uh, private label, and they are running with a partial TMR out there as well. Okay, now we go back uh, to Greg the, the last time. Uh, he also sent another question. He actually sent him at the same time. I thought it was another good question and not directly related to our uh, presentation here. And, and that is that um, the, the, uh, when evaluating uh, the, the lower value of, of Jersey bull calves, and I'm exactly right, do we have to give up some of the economic advantage? He said uh, the, the efficiency advantage. I think it's an economic advantage. And the answer is, yeah, you do. I think you really do. The two things I've stumbled across, we already talked about earlier in the presentation, and that is that we uh, uh, we were seeing crossbreds with a black, uh, getting a black bull calf, and that seems to help out a little bit, give me an extra hundred dollars or maybe even a market to sell those bull calves if you want. We do have a, a dairyman here in Illinois that he takes all his bull calves and he finishes them out himself, and he markets that as Jersey beef, and he's developed a market for that, believe it or not, in Chicago. Chicago. And I don't know if those chefs or those people um, have a, a reason for that, and away we go. Another very large farm here in Illinois that uh, you would recognize their name if I mentioned to them, and they basically use sex semen on all of their heifers and cows that they can get pregnant with one or two straws of sex semen. In other words, we're going to have heifer calves, and uh, the bull calves then uh, are trying to be minimized going that direction as well. So those are really some good questions. Uh, again, I want to click on our, our sponsors here. We do have a couple more that came in here. A uh, question that came in, uh, do jerseys have a lower fiber requirement and a higher carbohydrate requirement? And I don't think so. I don't think so. But let me give you again a study that came out of the Australian paper. And, and th that is that if you look at the dry matter per unit of body weight, the jerseys eat more. In other words, they, they have, they have uh, the ability for based on their body weight to eat more. I'm not sure that changes the fiber requirement, but it does allow my jerseys to eat relatively a little more compared to their body weight. I don't think 
that there is a difference in fiber requirements that I am aware of. I think, though, we bump it closer uh, with uh, trying to get more energy uh, into that and therefore increase rate of passage because we, we know that high fiber diets, a classic work coming out of the Minor Institute, unfortunately with Holsteins, but it is uh, with cows, sim- simply shows that you get to these higher fiber diets and if the physical form is uh, is not correct, we're, we're going to see less intake as far as that goes. Uh, we talk about intake on jersey. We had another uh, uh, crossbred Jersey breeder several years ago in Illinois who experimented with cutting the pasture the day before, especially if it wasn't going to rain. And he argued that he said, uh, he had no data to back it up, that because he had cut the grass, allowed those cows to go out there and eat that grass more as a, as a, as a, as a silage, if you wish, than having to rip it off, tear it off, and process it from there. So again, just words, words for uh, food for thought. Another question that came in here, and uh, wow, this is a tough one. It says, has there been a study to compare lifetime Time production, uh, fat corrected milk, or even pounds of fat and protein. And I, I think, got your ears on Jersey people. Really ride that horse all the way to the stable uh, or on the Kentucky Derby, as far as that goes, of Jerseys versus other breeds. And this question did come in earlier, uh, and uh, Patty uh, p- p- brought it up because uh, we could not find any any data on it. Now, maybe somebody out there, some geneticist, some researchers, has that in New Zealand or Denmark or Australia, because that's where you tend to see some of the good data coming from. Uh, I, I could not find it as far as that goes on lifetime production. The good news is jerseys tend to live longer uh, and crossbreds we know live longer. We know they have fewer calving problems and they have fewer, uh, they have uh, less uh, hoof uh, problems uh, because of some people say it's a black hoof. I'm not sure it's a black hoof. Maybe it has to do with being uh, uh, 400 pounds lighter as far as that goes. So certainly li- those would be all factors that if I were going to guess, Jim, I would guess the jerseys probably win that one uh, as far as uh, uh, other breeds. The other thing I love to see on our DHI reports, and that is uh, pounds of milk, and now it should be pounds of solids per day of lifetime in the herd. And again, that would be a very powerful one to look at. And now my DHI centers could probably pull that data for me to see what that number looks like, but they have to do it on a on a uh, pounds of fat basis, not on milk volume. So I guess we've uh, t- 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 took a swing at that and uh, probably missed the ball on that one there. The final, uh, we have one more question coming in and then uh, uh, we have one on copper. A question came in and I have no idea. I know by the person who asked the question, why is the dairy NRC being delayed 2020? And my understanding is talking with Bill Weiss, it's just a matter of time. And of course, all these people dedicate their time free. So if any one section is delayed, then it delays the the whole thing as far as that goes out there in the program uh, as, as a factor. Uh, the software program supposedly is not delaying it at this point, but they will have a, a disk. And I questioned that, and he said, and we were told, you will have a disk to go with that. So we're looking at late uh, 2019 or maybe 2020. I smile here because uh, Abby knows we've had the Bill Weiss schedule, schedule now for two years in a row to give us the update on the new NRC. And, of course, uh, you notice those webinars have not been held and will not be held in the near future. Uh, what about copper? Uh, that question came in at the Four State uh, Nutrition Conference. So I went back and looked at copper. As you know, copper uh, is a, uh, uh, Jersey is a little more sensitive to copper out there. So I went back and only 11 out of all the rations I received, only 11 of them had copper levels. And the range of that was uh, um, range from about 11 parts per million to uh, 27 parts per million. Most people say you got to stay below 50. At least that has been kind of the thumb rule that we saw from years work done by Dr. Hemken, bless his soul, at the University of Kentucky. Uh, Two of the reports actually had um, a total and added. So they split it out. And so you could see what was added. And in most cases here, uh, the the added uh, was very close to the total because there's very little copper in those rations where they're at. In fact, in some parts of Canada, the level of copper is basically uh, less than two parts 
cents per million. So again, that comes into play as well. So again, uh, that answers the copper question. So again, it looks like uh, the, the the average was right around uh, the, the right around in the teens, 13, 14 in that range. There it looks pretty safe to me as well. Then the last question I just came in and we're done. Thanks for answering my questions. Uh, just a comment: we use inoculants uh, with our jerseys, uh, biotin, uh, the buffer, and uh, uh, one of the yeast products out there as well. And um, I'm not sure, Jim, what that is. Uh, straw pollers. I'm not sure that's important. He said, uh, we are now averaging uh, 30, uh, 37 kilos on grass right now. He is uh, one of one of our, our, uh, our person that uh, came in from Europe, from the Netherlands there. And so you can see, multiply that by 2.2. That's going to get me pretty close to uh, 75 pounds of milk. So they're doing really, really well. You want to respond, uh, Tynus? Are you, are, oh, they're pellets, he said. Um uh, st- straw pellets, adding a straw pellet, that's uh, raising some more questions. Um, are you feeding up? I'm going to ask uh, since we got just a minute here and he's live, he's responding to me. Uh, are you feeding a partial TMR? Are you feeding them besides uh, the pellets uh, that are. Uh, are you feeding a, a, a grain in the parlor, and are you feeding a partial TMR? Uh, he sa- uh, I asked him what straw pollers, uh, straw, P-A-L-L-E-R-S. Paul, he says those are pellets, and all I would smile here and say, once you pellet a forage, it no longer functions like a fiber. It will lower starch and sugar concentrations and protein, but it will not function as functional fiber. At least that's been our experiences that we had here at Illinois uh, with, with pellets as far as that. Goes well, Abby. We're going to wrap up. Our time is gone here, so we'll let you wrap up the program. Thanks, Mike. That hour always goes quickly, especially when we have good presentations and good presenters like yourself. Um, I want to one more time thank um, Custom Dairy Performance KTG North America for sponsoring this presentation today, and Mike for giving us um, all this information in the presentation. Also, last but not least, I want to thank all of you who are listening out there today. We strive to provide information that's useful for you, whether you're a dairyman or working with clients, and we're thankful that you take the time to join us for these webinars. Um, Please make plans to join us again in September on the 10th. Um, That presentation, Bull Strain Transition Cow Immunity, will be presented by Marcus Curley from the USDA Animal Diagnostics Lab, and that webinar will be sponsored by Diamond V. Again, that will take place on September 10th. Um, This final slide here, for those of you that are still on, We just wanted to let you know that our webinar series um, took first, second, and third place at the American Agricultural Editors Association um, Awards program that took place at their recent conference, which is called Egg Media Summit. It's an opportunity for people who work in journalism and communications to submit entries in photography, writing, marketing, and in webinars, and to receive some valuable feedback from the judges and also earn some recognition. So we were really pleased and um, proud that a few of our webinars placed and kind of swept the category this year for second and third place. And we've had success in the past. So um, part of that is the webinars judged and part of it is, you know, how many people we have in attendance and how often the archives are viewed. So you listeners out there are all part of that. We're glad that you find value in the presentations and that the judges did as well. So um, thank you again for joining us today. And from all of us here at Horde Dairyman and the University of Illinois, we'd like to thank you for joining us and hope that we will have you as part of a webinar again in the future. Take care and enjoy the rest of your month.